Fireside Chat, Episode 8. Are the cupboards really bare? Recorded March 12th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back for another episode of Fireside Chat. This week, it's just Dan and Matt in the house. Lucas is on the injury reserve. How are you doing tonight, Matt? Oh, I'm pretty good. So unfortunately, they say as a scouting advantage, they won't tell us what Lucas is on the injury reserve with. All we know is it's a head injury. Probably a head cold. Yeah, he's a wuss. <laughs> Play through your cold. That's what I told him. But, you know, he said if Kiffer can take a month off, he gets at least one show off. Okay, why not? Yeah. So, how are you feeling about the team after coming home from the California road trip with zero points? Well, that, you know, if uh, someone played those games on a loop, you know, that, that might qualify for uh, crimes against humanity. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know, that was extremely painful to watch. I was shocked that we came home with no points. Like, I expected one point somewhere, you know, an overtime loss or a shootout loss or something. If you would have asked me what the worst case scenario was before we left, I would have said one point. I didn't think there was a way they were going to come home with nothing. Yeah, I would have thought they would have at least split the LA games. Like, I know we were kind of cursed in Anaheim, but. You know, to get nothing, that's just not acceptable, especially when you're already fighting just to make the playoffs. Yeah, like with the games that are in action tonight, like only the Tem- or Florida Panthers and Washington Capitals are behind us. Like, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, you know, I, I agree with what you said about Anaheim. I mean, I kind of wrote that game off as, well, there's no way we can win this one. I honestly thought they might even start Joey McDonald in that game just as a way to keep him in there, keep him going, but kind of write it off and then have Kipper play both L.A. games. But I just I couldn't believe the L.A. games. Like, we lost them both, and we didn't get a single point. And it seems like yeah. this team came out with a plan and stuck to the plan for the first, I don't know, six or eight shifts – And L.A.'s looking at them going, it shouldn't be this hard. Like, we're playing the Flames, and they make an adjustment, and we can't adjust to their adjustment. No. Well, like, in the second L.A. game, after the Kings went up, like, they didn't even really force at all the rest of the game, and yet the Flames were completely dumbfounded on how to get back into the game. And that's not helpful when you're trying to actually make the playoffs no and i mean that's the thing is we i i don't know about you but i know i went into that game or that road trip to california really optimistic we've seen some good things out of the team lately they seem to have been pulling it together and then we go into that road trip and you look and go you know what this is why this team is where they are well like the when they were matched up against the kings like you could actually see why the Flames are having difficulties. It's not so much talent, it's size. And, like, the Kings just, you know, like, each player on average weighs about 10 pounds more than the Flames. Well, that was evident because they lost every puck battle and they just couldn't get anything going. And you're not going to make the playoffs if you're being out-muscled in every aspect. It's true. Very true. You know that I've been the optimist on this show. I've been the one who's been, you know, saying that I didn't want to see a Gimla traded as a fan, and I'm the one that I think last week said, you know, the Flames can still do this, they can still, you know, get to eighth, and I'm looking around now, and I've pretty much written this team off. I think that even though they can mathematically make it, there's too many hurdles. There's too many teams playing each other between here and the end of the season, and I think we're going to have yet another year in Calgary with no postseason i think it's inevitable well well, if you look at the the hypothetical cutoff for eighth place is 54 points at this point in the season the flames need to get two out of every three points from here on out 
only the top five teams in the NHL have done that to this point. So I don't see the Flames magically becoming a top five team in the league for the next 24 games. And then, you know, that's just to get into eighth. Let alone, you know, the 54 might end up being 56 or 58. So, you know, it really does not seem like it's going to happen no matter how much we'd like. <laughs> Even if the hockey gods shine down on this team and somehow, somehow they get to eighth and, you know, this city goes nuts because they're in eighth, who do we take on? We take on Chicago, the team that's only lost two reg- two games so far this season. There's no way. I don't care what you say about, you know, if you get to the dance, you've always got a chance. There's no way this team can beat the Blackhawks in, se- in a seven-game series. The only way the Flames would be able to beat the Blackhawks is if the Blackhawks beat themselves because there is just no way. And or if like, we sabotage them. It wouldn't matter if uh, the Flames matched up against Anaheim, Minnesota, Vancouver, San Jose. Like, I just don't see them even being able to compete in a seven-game series. They might be able to win a game, maybe two, but... Yeah, so, I mean, I think even if you get to eighth place this year, what's the point? I mean, you know, as you guys have said, and as maybe I should have listened to a bit better, so you get to eighth, you get knocked out, you get a crappy draft pick, what's the point? I think even if Chicago were to rub it in our face and bring Hank up as a goalie and play him for that whole series, they'd still beat us. Yeah, I honestly think that even if they had no goalie, they might still win. (laughs) Play six players against our five? Well, you never know. I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's sad. I mean, as a fan, you know, as a homer and a Flames fan, it's sad to think another season without postseason hockey. Yeah, it's just unfortunate, but this team is built kind of unusual. Like... The, normally, like most teams, they try to pair like one defensive defenseman with one offensive defenseman if possible. And seven of the eight Flames eight defensemen are more offensively oriented, and like that, usually those type of players aren't as good in their own end. And like that's part of the reason why we're giving up so much. Like it yeah, just everything's a little confusing with how the pro team is put up, put together. And, you know, I know we'll get into this more as we move towards the trade deadline, but for years fans have said things need to happen, moves need to be made, and the team hasn't necessarily made all the moves that perhaps people think they need to. But there's no choice anymore. I mean, contracts are expiring. Jerome's contract's up this year. Kipper's is coming to a close. So I think that the inevitable is going to have to come, and this team's going to have to figure out what their priority is very quickly. Yeah. Well, if you look at the uh, the contracts that are expiring uh, both this year and next, like that's almost the entire team's worth of cap outside of Tangay and Glencross. So, Do you mind if I run through who's a UFA at the end of this year? Go right ahead. Jerome Aginla, Roman Cervenka, Blake Como, Michael Backlund's an RFA, uh, Brian McGratton, Paul Byron is an RFA, Steve Bajan, Anton Babchuk, Chris Butler's an RFA, and TJ Brody's an RFA. So that leaves us with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That leaves us with only 12 contracts, including Mika Kiprasov. Oh, and Joey McDonald's a UFA as well. So 12 contracts, including Mika Kiprasov's, going into next year. Yeah, like that, that's why rebuilding right now makes the most sense. Because, you know, we're already, for all intents and purposes eliminated from being a playoff team so why not trade off anybody that you can get something for you know it's a shortened season the fans don't have to put up with an extra 24 games of being terrible so you know you can just kind of erase this season from memory start fresh next year getting the new players that you acquire and you know sign up few free agents because we'll have about 15 million dollars depending on 
who's available, uh, or like who we trade off. Like if Glenn Cross or Camilleri or Bowmeister, if they get moved, like that'll open up more money, so you can throw some more money around and get another guy like Hoodler or Weidman, and you know see what you got next year. And that's something I think the Flames have done very well in the last, I don't know, five years, is pick those guys like the Hoodlers and the Glenn Crosses and these kind of of middle-of-the-road guys and really give them the chance to open up and become a good NHLer. And that's what I want to see this summer, again, is find those middle-of-the-road guys we're not paying a lot for, but who end up really being good for this team. Yeah, like, you know, there this year there is going to be quite a few good free agents and there are going to be teams that are wanting to dump cap hits because of Mm -hmm. the cap lowering to 64 million so there is going to be alternatives available so why not just cut your losses with this group and you know new season get you know like you could even go back like if you trade Jerome you could go and re-sign him in the off season I thought about that um, so let's, and, and you know, I've, I've thought, I've honestly thought about that is what if the team trades him as a rental and then signs him back in the off season for half the cost and it would be, it'd be a ballsy move. And I think if it happened, um, Jay Feaster would almost be the new evil genius of the NHL. Well, it's somewhat similar to what, uh, the St. Louis blues did uh, that one year when they traded Kachuk over to Atlanta when they went. They actually made the playoffs, <laughs> and they got a first rounder and something else for him. And then yeah. right after, he went right back on July first, back to the Blues. So... I think the only the only thing with Jerome is if I'm another GM trading for him, you're gonna and I mean you know as much as somebody's word only means so much, you're gonna want to get a verbal assurance from him and his agent that um, you know there's some commitment to stay there if you're giving up anything of value for him. Uh, not necessarily, because a lot of teams, like, yeah, look at Nashville last year when they dropped the first to Buffalo for Gostad. Like, they, I don't think they re-signed them. So, it, you know, it's basically tossing an asset at the team for that player for this year, and if you keep them good, if you don't, you know. I know this name brings up a lot of mixed feelings in Calgary, but while we're talking about Jerome, if you don't mind me jumping in, are you done? Yep. Um, Did you see the article by Eric Francis about Jerome? No. Eric Francis called Don Meehan, uh, Jerome's agent, and thought, you know, let's find out from the source what's going on. And Don Meehan, now again, we can only take these guys on what they've said and what's been published because we don't have any inside sources, but Don Meehan said he hasn't even talked to the team. Yeah, he he hasn't talked to the Flames about a renewal. So to me, it's like if you're planning to renew your star, you you would have talked to the agent by now. Well, plus, so I gotta, think Jerome's probably trying to make a decision of what he's gonna do. Yeah, and like realistically, if you are Jerome Aginla, like you're looking at the team and its current situation, and you know, I I personally wouldn't be overly thrilled. You know, I might like the situation around the team, but the direction it is, like, I, I'm i looking at it and going, this team's not going to be making the playoffs anytime soon. You know, I want to win a cup, so why am I going to stay here? Let's see how it goes. Yeah, at the same time, though, I know that there's a lot of personal decisions that get put into that. He's good friends with uh, Murray Edwards. And, you know, he's been treated well here. And as much as you're right, as a hockey decision, it seems like it's a no-brainer for him to leave. But, you know, his family's here. Who knows what all goes into that decision? Well, that's why I'm thinking that might be a possibility of us trading him and then, you know, like have like a prearranged deal type of thing. The other thing I've thought, too, is I, I want Jerome, again, as a fan of this team, I want Jerome to retire as a flame. And let's say he does leave and he goes to whoever. What's to say he doesn't come back in two years and, you know, play a year here for a million bucks just to play his last year here before he hangs him up? Yeah, sort of like Ryan Smith and Edmonton. 
Exactly. You know, you bring him back, you bring him back for a year. He's not expected to be the hero. He's expected to be the Conroy-like player, the guy you put a C on. He's your, you know, your, um, the player you, you turn to for leadership more than actual production. And yeah. then he retires, and he gets either an office job, or he's behind the bench, or he's doing what Lanny's doing. He's the face of this franchise till he's, you know, 100 years old. Yeah. Well, basically, that's who I was going to compare it to, would be like Lanny back when we won the Cup. Like, you know, not the, you know, leader of the team in, in terms of goal scoring, but the leader of the team as a person. You know, and if he can... Yeah, you know, like that would be a good possibility, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, who who knows what's going to happen there? And I think we can. We, I mean, we could probably do hours of speculation like anybody else could. I think we just have to wait a couple weeks and see what happens. Yeah. If you're Jay Feaster, when do you put the open for business sign or the for sale sign out? Do you wait till the till the deadline, I, or do you start taking I offers now? I honestly think that that open for business sign is probably already hanging in the window. Because, you know, like, logistically, teams will need to have a chance to get their scouts out, and this and that, like we've seen in the last couple weeks. And, you know, if they need to make roster adjustments, like uh, Philadelphia traded a player today to Columbus just to get the contract off the books. So, you know, like... They can, they need to do their preparations because, like, it you don't just magically in five minutes make a trade. It's a lot of moving pieces to get everything. Especially when you're bringing in a salary of this size and a player of this caliber. Yeah, and it wouldn't really matter if you're talking a Genla or Bolmeister or Camilleri or Giordano, any of those guys. You would have to do more than you know, your fair share of homework to make sure what you're getting in return is good and what they're getting in return is good. Do you think, I mean, so if we say that that for sale sign is on the window, do you think if you're feaster at this point, you're sitting back and waiting for offers, or do you think you're out actively shopping? Uh, I would expect him to be actually actively shopping because of the fact that there's the other teams that are in the similar place as the Flames. They don't have anybody that's a good piece as a rental. Like, other than Washington with Mike Ribeiro, all the other teams, their available players are not that good. So, you know, the Flames have several pieces that are that caliber, but, you know, so I would expect them to be knocking on every door because everybody needs a good offensive defenseman, and we have two of possibly available. Everybody needs a goal scorer, and we got the Gimla and Glenn, or Camilleri that are both, you know, available, so... Do you think yeah. it's inevitable that Bo Meester's leaving this team? Maybe not this year, but do you think it's inevitable he's out of here in the next 12 months? I would be somewhat shocked if he finished his contract and re-upped after, because like, I don't have anything against Bo Meester. Like, I liked him when he was in Florida, and I've liked him when he's here. It's just you need different people in the organization as a whole and we've kind of sucked ever since he got here you and know, if we're if we're gonna get rid of him not, i think this is the year i mean he's having yeah. a hell of a year he's had his best year i should say in terms of his flames production he's having a hell of a year this yeah. is his best year as a flame he's got 12 points in 24 games so far he's m- minus four now is the year you're going to get the best return yeah. for him well he's basically returned to the florida style production that, you know, we thought we were getting in the first place. But, you know, like, he's not someone that you go, oh, that person is vital to the makeup of my team. You know, he's not Kiprasov, he's not Aginla. So, you know, he's a top-end secondary piece. So well, that's the way I've looked yeah. at it. Even on the defensive, I mean, I think that, you know, if you're looking at the face of the blue line, it's Giordano. 
And I think that Bo Meester is the easily expendable piece that will make a return there. Nobody's going to give us anything for Babchuk or Sarich or Smith. I think Weidman's going to stick around. We're not trading Brody, I hope. So I think he's the only piece there you'd want to move that you get something for. Well, I think uh, the Flames should actually look at moving Giordano as well, but that's just me. Because he hasn't been the same ever since his injury last year. And, you know, it's sort of like selling before the value falls out. <laughs> yeah, at the same time, I mean, yeah, sort of like know, what, they're going to have to move like some veterans, but you can't move here. all the vets in one season either. No, but then again, it depends on what you're getting back. Because, like, if you, say, like, trade... Uh, Giordano for an, another defenseman. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Like yeah. one of the rumors, like I heard uh, today, was uh, Bolmeister for Ian Cole and uh, Chris Stewart from St. So, Louis. Yeah, you know, yeah. So you could realistically put Cole in that top four and take the pressure off if you traded both. It, you know, it really it depends on what the actual trades are. That's true. So maybe you're not trading everybody for, you know, future players or for prospects and draft picks, but you're trading roster players for roster players that will help us develop in the future. Yeah, it, it really it depends because, mm-hmm. you know, I don't see, it, like, everybody getting traded for first-round picks. No. You know, in a in a deep draft year, prospects. teams aren't just going to want to give away their first round picks. No, not unless they're in the 25th overall range and then who cares? Well, and, and if you're in the yeah, I mean if you're in the 25th overall range, you don't really want Jay Bomeister. Maybe you do for the playoffs, but yeah, you're not going to be there might be better deals out there to be made. Yeah. It depends. So speaking of the draft, um, assuming, as I think we've all come to grips with now, I, by everyone I think me, I was probably the last guy to come to grips with this, but this team's got to start looking not towards the 8th place spot and looking towards um, not making the playoffs, perhaps having the lowest draft pick this team's ever had. We've never drafted lower than 6th. And what's out there? I mean, what's in our system to bring up next year? Because we can't fire everybody and replace it all with UFAs and draft picks. So, you know, and who's available in the draft that might help the team now or in a few years? I know you were doing your homework on the draft. Yeah. Assuming that uh, the Flames do pick in the top five, the there are several players that are really exceptional players. Uh Valerie Nikushkin and Jonathan Drouin are both wingers, and they're likely to go one and f- four or five in the draft. You have Nathan McKinnon and Alexander Barkov, who are both centers, and Seth Jones. Now, the problem with uh, McKinnon and Drouin is that they're both under six feet tall. They're both exceptionally skilled. It's just that I'm worried that, like, if you look at the Flames' prospects, Backlund is only six feet tall, Berchi is 5'11", Gaudreau's 5'6". You kind of get running into too many smaller players, and as we saw with the L.A. game, that's not, you know, advantageous. Me, personally, the player that I like the most of the players that are going to go in the top five is Alexander Barkov, because he's both a center yeah, and he's talked about him quite a bit. So, you know, he's got the size that you would need, like Jankowski last year, and he's tearing up the SM Liga. He has 48 points already this season, which is the most... SM Liga is the Finnish National League, for anyone that doesn't know. Yeah. So, you know, like that, it... You can't really go wrong with any of those players, because unlike the, the past years, each one of these players would probably be either first or second overall Yeah. over the past few drafts. 
So, you know, it's just pick your poison, basically. And, you know, if someone's looking, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if someone's looking at the stats, like TSN always posts their draft listings, Barkov is a little bit um, deceiving if you just look at his numbers. Because he's only had uh, 47 points this year in the Russian League, where guys like Drew Ann are playing in, or sorry, in the Finnish League, where guys like Drew Ann are playing in the QMJHL and have like 90 points, uh, McKinnon's got 69. It's harder to score in the Finnish league because you're playing with men, not just 18, 19 year olds. Yeah, that's why like a lot of teams they break it down to like the actual age group uh, when they're scouting. Because like uh, if you look at the top four for uh, the players under the age of 20 in the SM Liga, you have Barkov with 48 points. And then you have Joel Armia, who was drafted in the mid-first round a couple years ago, at, with 33. Uh, Toivu Teravainen, who was drafted last year, at, and he has 31. And our own Marcus Grandland is right behind them with 30 points. So you can kind of see that, you know, there that guy is above those other guys that were taken in the first round, so he's a little bit better. I think so. I'm guessing, but... So, let's say that the Flames aren't in the top five, but are in the top ten, which I think everyone can agree they will be in the top ten. Or let's say they trade down from the top five to the top ten um, to get, you know, a roster player. Who do you take in the top ten? Well, the strange thing with this particular draft is that it's full of centers and defensemen, which is advantageous because... We Especially if we end up trading away Bullmeister and... 21 of... Yeah. yeah. Well, 21 of the 30 players that are expected to go in the first round, give or take, are either centers or defensemen. And the players that are ranked about 5 to 8 are... Three of them are centers and two of them are defensemen. So, you know, you can go with any of them, and you should get something decent. Would you be open to the Flames trading down? I mean, let's say they are in the top five, trading down as long as they stay in the top ten, if the deal's right? Honestly, if they have a chance to draft Barkoff or Jones or McKinnon, they need to take it, because the rest of the guys, while they're decent, they're a little bit of a step down, and, you know, they'd almost be better off trading off a current roster mm-hmm. player and getting an extra If, let's say the Flames it, make it to the bottom ten, that. win the lottery by some miracle. I mean, something's got to go right for this team this year, right? Say they win, the mir- they win the lottery and somehow they're drafting first. Would you trade down as long as you're in the top three? Possibly, depending on what the return is. Uh, me personally, I would take Barkoff even first overall, but that's just, you know, drafting need versus, you know, because I think um, Barkoff and McKinnon are more or less equivalent, and Drouin, they're all in that general range. It'd be a coin toss between him and Jones, but... Yeah, if you're we're picking anywhere in the top three, you're guaranteed to get one of those guys. So who cares? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, experts are saying rip. this year is a deep draft. So I think even going into round two and three, uh, the Flames are going to have a lot of good picks available to them. And we might see some. I mean, even last year, you know, the Flames said their top two guys were the two guys they got in round one and two, and they were willing to trade up to make sure they got the guy they wanted in round two, who they did anyways. I forget what his name was. Um, but, you know, so I think Flames this year really Seal. know this is going to be a rebuild year. They have to get some good, and what a better time to do that than in a deep draft. I mean, that's a perfect time to restock the cupboards, and I think there's going to be a lot available. Talking to, well, not talking to, listening to experts um, a lot of them have said the top 75 players are all really good. I mean, obviously your top 10, your top 30 are the best, but there's good players all the way up to about 75. Yeah. Well, like, if you're looking, like, even in the middle of the first round, like, say we get another second round, or first round pick somehow, 
Like, you have a guy like Frederick Gauthier, who's 6'5 and a center, and he's pretty good at both ends of the rink. So, like, there are options, you know, there's lots of options available. Yeah, like, there are quite a few large defensemen, good offensive defensemen, good defensive defensemen. So, really, like, getting more picks you're going to have more of a chance to actually get ones that actually hit the mark and develop into good players. Well, and that's always been something that I've always, I guess, called my draft philosophy. And I've never been to an NHL draft or any draft, but I've always thought the more chances you have to pick, the better your success rate's going to be. So I've always thought if you can flip a guy, like let's say we can flip Blake Como for a fourth or fifth round pick, do it just to get the pick because you never know what it'll amount to. Well, like, if you, uh, I do believe if you combine all the draft years over the last 20 years, uh, from the 4th to 7th round, you're likely to hit, uh, at, get an NHL or about 15 to 20% of the time. So, you know, if you got 5 or 6 picks, you're likely to get somebody out of that. So, Combine that over two or three years and your chances go up dramatically. Well, like if you look at the LA Kings, what they did a few years ago was they traded off all their veterans for draft picks. And like they had like three years in a row where they had like 12, 13, 14 picks. And what did that cause? Well, they're almost a half, over half of their team is their own players that they drafted. Because they managed to get, find guys in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth round that actually developed into useful players. But if you only have three or four picks, the likelihood of you actually hitting the bullseye with it, it gets reduced. So, you know, that's why the Flames really do need to look at rebuilding, getting more picks, especially in a deep draft, and hope that you get a handful of guys out of it. I think the best example of that is having the the most number of picks and surely getting somebody out of it was the 98 draft when Colorado picked one, two, three, four times in the first round. And they got Alex Tange, they got um, Robin Regeer, Scott Parker, and Martin Skula. So two two out of four became NHL staples. And the other two played for quite a while as well. So. Yeah, they played for for a while, and I mean, they were NHL staples as well, but that that's a good record. And then you get into their second round, and they picked Philip Sove. So, you know, you hit a bump somewhere. Um, aside from the draft, unless there's anything else you want to talk about there, <clears throat> I think we need to look inside the system, and what do the Flames have already that guys we might see come up next year or the year after? Well, I mentioned uh, Marcus Grandland. He's fourth in the SM Liga for players under the age of 20. So, you know, he seems to have quite a bit of the same skill set as his brother in from Minnesota. So, you know, hopefully he continues to progress. He's likely not going to be ready for another two years, maybe three. But... You know, a skilled player nonetheless. Uh, John Gaudreau, of course, with Boston and the NCAA, he's been tearing it up, and he's going to likely be a finalist for the Hobie Baker. And he is pretty much one wherever he's gone. And he definitely fits the mold of a Daniel Briere, Martin St. Louis type. For anyone that's not that... familiar with the uh, with the Hobie Baker, what is that trophy? Uh, it's the MVP of the league. Yeah. And, uh, one of his teammates is also a Flames prospect, Bill Arnold. Uh, he, in 34 games this year, he's almost been a point per game with 33. Now, from my research into NCAA players, is that players that have in the mid-30s or better eventually tend to become NHL players of some sort. Yeah, you know, it the shorter players not so much, but uh, I think Bill Arnold's six two or six three. So, you know, it he's not necessarily gonna be 
a top line player, but he could become a solid third or fourth line center that can chip in 30 points. Well, and that's the thing is every team needs 12 forwards dressed. So not everybody you draft, even guys from the first round, are always going to end up being your top three, top six guys. We need to fill out that roster, and we're going to need those guys down the road, those bottom six guys. Mm. And, uh, of course, um, Mark Jankowski was drafted in the first round. He's uh, put up 16 points in 30 games in the NCAA, which does seem a little bit low, but... For someone that's adjusting to a significant increase in the level of competition, that's about on par for how he should have performed. Yeah, I was going to say, he just moved up from high school to NCAA this year. Yeah, so going from a bunch of high, yeah, it's going from a bunch of high school kids to guys that are like 23, 24 years old. It's a little bit of a difference. Um, Chris Creeder, when he, because uh, he... Uh, went from uh, high school league to the NCAA. He had a similar amount of points, and then the next season he increased that and that eventually became a point-per-game player before he left to join the Rangers. So if Jankowski can be on that development curve, then he too should become something useful. In a couple of years, probably not going to be ready for another two or three seasons. But yeah, he wasn't taken to be, you know, an impact player right away. Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm looking at the list of Flames prospects on on the uh, Ford side. I'm going to name some names. You tell me if you ever think these guys are going to make the NHL or at least with this team in some sort of full time role. Akima Lou. Uh, possible fourth liner, but not really anything more than that. I think, he, yeah, I think he might amount to a 13th, for, 13th forward, maybe. Uh, what about Carter Banks? Uh, non-NHLer. Lance Boma? Uh, same as a Lou. Give or Roman take. Horak? Uh. He's had an interesting year, because he's played for both the Flames and the Heat. I think he eventually sticks, but he has to basically become a Stefan Niel type of, like, a shutdown center. I don't see him having the offensive tools to stick in an offensive role. But if he, you know, he's done a good job with the defensive side of it, so if he can become a shutdown guy, he might be a third or fourth line center. Yeah, he's a natural center, which is a benefit there. What about Ryan House? Bust. Greg Nemitz? Bust. Yeah, I gotta agree with you on those last two. Galen Patterson? Not an NHLer. I don't think so. I think he's got a future in the AHL. That'll be his whole career. Mm -hmm. And uh, last one, Max Reinhardt. Bust. And the only other two guys that are listed on the official list of prospects is Ben Street and Ben Walter, but I think both those guys are past there. I mean, that Street is 26, Walter's 28. Those aren't the guys you look at for the future. Yeah. With Reinhardt, how would you say it? Players that uh, become decent NHLers usually tear up the AHL, even in some capacity, like they show that they have something. But when you've played 60 games and you have 4 goals and 12 assists and are minus 24, Mm -hmm. that's not exactly tearing up anything. No, I think we might be able to move Reinhardt at some point, not for anything, you know, like a first round, but I think we could end up moving him um, at some point and get some value out of him, even if it's a low round pick or another prospect to try out. Or say like like, uh, how Patrick Holland was included in the Bork Camilleri trade. You know, like a secondary piece type of Yeah, thing. something like that. Um, what about on the blue line? Who do you see as the big prospects on the blue line? Uh, you have uh, Patrick Seeloff, who... That's the guy I was trying to remember. That was the second-round pick last year. Yeah, he's not going to blow you away on the score sheet, but that's not his game. He is 
probably of the defensive prospects we have is likely the most NHL likely of the group because he just plays that shutdown role of like the Corey Sarich or Robin Regeer type. You know, he'll hit, do everything responsible on his own end. So, you know, you need that. And, like, he's pretty much the only guy that we have in the system that is like that. Most of our other defense prospects are more offensively oriented, like a TJ Brody versus, you know, the defense. Yeah, I don't know if I'd call Brody a prospect anymore. I'm similar in style, not him specifically. You know, and if I look on the blue line, it's weird because the Flames, a lot of people would say, have, you know, a solid blue line on the NHL. I mean, solid for a 13th place team. But that's where I think that we're weak in depth. If I look at the uh, if I look at the depth they've got there and the prospects, there's not a lot of good or even, I don't think, serviceable potential NHLers. No. And Seeloff will make it. I think John Ramage could make it. I'm a little iffy on him. I actually don't think the Flames will end up signing him. No, I don't think the Flames might, but I think he'll make the NHL somewhere, even if as a yeah. seventh defenseman. I can agree with that. But like Brady Lamb, James Martin, um, Brett Calk, Ryan Calkin, they're not gonna they're not gonna be Flames. The only other guy maybe is well, Tyler Weatherspoon. What do you think? Uh, of him? Actually, with Culkin and Kulak, they're both very similar to uh, TJ Brody in it when they were his age. Or, you know, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Because um, Brody They're both was, 19. Well, he, Brody, when he was uh, coming up, he was more of a forward who had to learn how to play defense. And, like, you've seen that a bit with him on the actual Flames because he hasn't fully learned how to play in his own end. He's improving, though. But with Culkin and Kulak, I think that, like, they both have uh, over 40 points this season in their junior leagues. So, like, they got the offensive game down. It's just the matter of teaching them the defensive game. And that'll determine whether or not they actually make the NHL or if they're just mm-hmm. useless. Do you think they could be long shot prospects? Yeah, sort of like TJ Brody was. Like I, nobody expected him to amount to anything, and now he's looking like the, one of our, if not our, top defensemen. So, moving to the net, what do, what does the future look like in goal? Uh, that's probably the Flames' best area. Uh, they have Laurent Brassat and Jonathan Gillies. In, both 19-year-olds. Yeah. They're both doing rather well in their respective leagues. Um, Gillies has uh, posted a 15-10 and 10 record with a 2.06 goals against average and a 9.32 save percentage. And he has five shutouts, which is the most in the NCAA and he's routinely been like the top defensive player in the league if I recall correctly I was just going to say the other thing talking about goalies I'm just looking up his stats now um, those two guys are doing really well and I've actually seen a couple games that uh, Gillies has played just watching them online and I've been really impressed with what I've seen I'm hearing some good things, too, about Ordeo this year. He went back to Finland, and apparently he's having a really good year. That's, you know, goalies, it's such a crapshoot because you really don't know what you've got until they either completely flame out or they improve. So it doesn't really surprise me that he's having a good year. Whether or not you bring him back and he actually performs over here or not is yet to be seen. But, you know, it never hurts. You know, especially with the aging goaltender in Kippersoff, you need a replacement somewhere. <laughs> so, Well, having... I think right now the organization is looking, and he's far from being a prospect, but I think the organization right now is hanging their hat on Kari Ramo coming over next year and taking over for the aging Mika Kippersoff. Well, like, if you also look at uh, at the other leagues, like, 
in the NCAA, Eric Hartzell, he's a unrestricted free agent at the end of the year and able to sign with anybody, and he's been tearing up the college ranks. And in the SM Liga, Antti Ranta is also performing well above the rest of the competition. So, you know, it's not necessarily the guys that are currently in our organization either, because both Gillies and Brassat are 19, so it's going to take them a while to get to the NHL. But, you know, there's other ways of getting... Some, well, if, the, if there's an unsigned goalie in the Finnish league, you know what that means, or he's going to be a duck next year. Probably they seem to they seem to have that talent to go out and find these goalies that are unsigned and bring them in and make them look spectacular. Well, it, it never hurts if you got someone that's in a men's league and is performing significantly better than everybody else. Why not give them a shot? Worst case scenario is he becomes another Henrik Carlson, mediocre backup that you either just let walk or you get a seventh round pick for, and who cares? But if you don't try, you don't know. Because, like, who would have thought Fast would come in and be awesome for the Ducks? Well, and looking at the Flames, too, I mean, they tend to, you know, change uh, goaltenders. More than they change their underwear. Like every you know season or two, we're getting a new backup. So I don't see why you wouldn't keep a lot of these guys in the system, find places for them to play, be it the AHL, the ECHL, somewhere, and then give them each a try. You know, for a season, half season, something like that. Yeah. Well, like, especially like with uh, Brassois, he's going to be uh, going in, into the AHL next year. Whether you bring Ordi over or not, who knows. And Gillies, he's got another three years in the NCAA, so, you know, you can get someone that's a shorter term stopgap to see if, you know, like that's why I was mentioning the two other goalies, because, you know, if the Flames do trade Kipper, they'll need something. I agree. You're. I mean, you have to have two goalies, right? So you're going to need something. You can't just trade Kipper and bring up Danny Taylor and expect he's going to be the, the new face of the franchise net. Exactly. You can't have a McDonald-Taylor pairing and expect anyone to take you credibly as a Trade Kipper, guy. trade McDonald, and have your uh, Taylor-Irving pairing. There you go. That's a winning team. Well, that would definitely guarantee us first overall. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, maybe that's what we end up seeing. I hope not. But well, uh, you know, they lose against Detroit and Nashville this week. It might end up coming closer to fruition. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So I, I'm just going to throw these out there. I was doing some research today, and you've heard the old saying: "It's better to do business with the devil you know than with the devil you don't." What former Flame centerman? are still playing, that they might be able to go out and bring back. And I've combed the Flames roster since um, 1999 to now, trying to look for centermen that are still active, but not in the NHL. You ready to hear this list, Matt? Oh, I'm sure it's super star-filled. We'll start it off with Byron Ritchie, Benoit Grattan, Eric Landry, and Nat Domnichelli. Yeah, super. They're all natural though. centermen. I mean, if we're looking for that, you know, first overall pick, we brought back uh, Steve Beja, and why not bring back Nat Dominic Kelly at the same time? Yeah, well, with him and McGratton, you know, why not? In doing this research, I also found out, believe it or not, Rico Fata is still playing. Nice. He'd look good on a line with Como. They are about the same talent level. <laughs> I don't know what uh, what number he wears, but then uh, Lucas could refer to him just by his number as well. Make him 71. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, 17 and 71. Or you make him number one, and you make Como number seven, and then t- collectively they're 17. Uh, that'd work. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh. Rico Fata actually was drafted first round sixth overall, so the highest pick the Flames have ever had, which was sixth overall, and they drafted Fata, which makes me a little bit nervous if they get the fifth round pick. I mean, same guy who drafted Fata, Todd Button, is still in charge of the scouting department. 
So who knows well, if he'd actually it, make the right choice this year? Well, how would you say I'm not entirely displeased that Todd Button's still here because it, he's just the head of the department. You gotta look at the fact that the actual scouts have changed because if the guys that are in the field all the time are saying, oh, this guy's great and he stinks, well, that's not really the fault of the guy in charge necessarily. No, but at the same time, the guy in charge has the final sign-off, right? Yeah, I'm not arguing that. You know, like I, I think what we're probably seeing now is one of the hockey guys in this organization, be it Weisbrot or Conroy, I think we're seeing one of those guys working with Button a lot more than we ever have in the past to create that list of who we're gonna who we're gonna uh, draft when, and I think that's really helped too because those guys know what Feaster wants, what the organizational needs are. Yeah, well, plus you're not uh, because we don't have any insider information. Like perhaps under Sutter that he dictated, oh, well, we only want this type of player, so get us the best list of this type of guy. Yeah. Leading to picks like Pellick and Chucko and Leland Irving that haven't exactly turned out. <laughs> so, you know, it... It depends on what the dictates from above are as well. And I'm not excusing Todd Button at all, but, you know, we just don't know the situation that's going on. And, like, over the last couple years, we've seen guys like Berchi, Godro, Jankowski, Granlund, that all seem to be performing well to this point being drafted by us so you know it, the direction seems to have changed whether that's the scouts in the field the people upstairs whatever well and and the fact that Todd Button is and I'm not totally blaming on Button either I mean like you said he's the top guy and he's the one that's easy to blame yeah. um, and I think his name has almost come up as a joke now in this city whenever there's a bad draft pick but the fact that he's lasted through what, three GMs now? Says yeah. that there's something about him that guys don't want to fire. I mean, they bring in their own teams, but they're keeping Button around. So there's obviously something there that people yeah. want to hang on to him for. And, you know, you know, if the picks that we've made recently develop, then, you know, he'll be lauded as helping to turn around everything. So, who, you know, it just depends on where we go from here. And, you know, like if the Flames have a top five pick and they end up taking someone like uh, how L.A. took Thomas Hickey last, like a few years ago, where everyone's going, why? Then, you know, but <laughs> if they actually pick appropriate people for the picks that they're making then it's all good <laughs> and i mean the first round should be easy but you know let's make it clear that nobody drafts a hundred percent of the time all the right players so oh, no. we're good we're gonna get bust you shouldn't be getting them you know like rico fata style bust but everyone's gonna bust at some point i mean you know patrick stefan was a bust he's a first round guy you never know what's gonna happen but it's gonna happen to this organization again is we're gonna get more bust oh yeah well look at greg nemus Right? He's been not very good ever since we drafted him. So, like, you're still going to have players that aren't great. But uh, we need to get enough picks where we can hit the marks like we did with TJ Brody. And, you know, hopefully get more like that. So that way we don't have to rely on guys like Aginla or Camilleri, or Tangay, or Stempniak, or Glenn Cross, or Bo Meester, all guys that are 30-ish or above, and can instead rely on fresh guys that are young and can contribute. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, you're always going to need those guys that are over 30. You can't run a team that's hardly, you know, old enough to grow facial hair. But no. you're gonna need you're gonna need those guys. But I think you're right. It's not relying on this, putting them into the lineup as the mentors almost, 
And yeah. I'd be okay to see Alex Tange stay around in that kind of role, being that older guy who plays second, third line minutes. But yeah, yeah. I think that's the one thing people, when you listen to fans talk about blowing this team up, they want to get rid of anyone who's over the age of 29, and that's just not feasible. No, like uh, how the Flames have Tange, Glenn Cross, Hoodler, Weidman, like that's a good group of secondary players, like, you're not going to rely on any of them to lead the team, but they, they're they there, and they're quality, so that way they can help teach the other guys how to be any gelers that, you know, like, say, Sven Berchi, if he reestablishes himself as a good prospect and player in the league, you know, he, they, those kind of guys can help to make them into a star player, not, you know, hindering them. Well, let's leave it off on this thought, if, unless you've got anything else you want to cover. Nah, I'm um, good. If the Flames start the rebuild this summer, do you think they will still rebuild faster than the Oilers will? I doubt it. Just to, it depends on if they blow it up in the next couple of weeks and they actually get legitimate things for those players, then perhaps yes, if not, no. So we may have a couple more disappointing seasons of seeing the Oilers in the postseason before we are. Yeah, it, it, as long as we blow it up to an extent now, we might be able to get there before the Oilers do. But if we are stubborn and hold on to everybody for a 14th or 15th place finish, then, you know, that'll, we, we likely won't see the playoffs before 2020. <laughs> I think that's a good estimation. Before we go, I just want to remind people that you can find all the episodes of the show, this episode, past episodes, and future episodes on firesidechat.ca. Um, you can subscribe to the show there through iTunes or the RSS feed if you want to listen to it in another fashion. Uh, we've got great articles, most of them written by Matt, uh, that cover topics about the Flames, games the Flames play. It's a great place to go and get your Flames fix. If you prefer Twitter, Facebook, or Google+, uh, Fireside Chat is on all of those networks as well. And the links to the Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus are all on the firesidechat.ca website. So go there. You can get access to us through whatever means is the most accessible to you. And if you're enjoying the show, please send your friends, send your family, uh, send people you don't like. If they're Flames fans, we'd, we'd love to have them exposed to our show and let them hear what it is we're doing. So with that, Matt, I think we should get out of here. Yep. Have a great week, and let's hope we don't go this week with no points either. Yeah, and get well soon, Lucas. Get well soon, Lucas, and we'll see you. Hopefully he'll be here next week. He'll be off the IR and ready to join us. Have a great week, Matt. Yep, take care. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. Theme music, Take the Lead, by Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod.